Welcome everyone back to another episode of the Elephant in the Room series hosted by Dovu. My name is Radhika Bachu and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Dovu. If you've tuned into our other podcasts, I, I call myself the Super Striker. I'm not joined by my current host, but today we have someone even more exciting. Uh, Ro will kill me for saying that. But, <laughs> so today we're joined by David from Honeycoin. Um, Dovu and Honeycoin are entering into a partnership that we're super excited about and we are empowering the users of Honeycoin to be able not only to do payments, airtime buying and David will explain more but also empower them to now save and invest which is a really important part of all of our journeys. So David chime in and tell me what you think about the partnership. Uh, thank you so much for having me Radhika. So I'm David Nandwa, CEO, CTO and founder here at Honeycoin and you know as Radhika has alluded to but I'm happy to just bring it now, you know, closer to home, we are thrilled to be announcing a partnership with Dovu through which users on the Honeycoin app will now be able to actually invest in all Dovu products directly from our platform. So we have integrated with Dovu to be able to allow all of our customers within their sort of like uh, wallets to invest directly from any of the balances that they store with us. Now, why this is a game changer is because um, we see Indovo as a category-defining product within the investment space. So we at Honeycoin are basically a fintech company, but we primarily serve both consumers and businesses. Mm -hmm. And the overall goal and, and the reason for the quirky name is we exist to make payment experiences delightfully sweet and painless for our customers. Which is much needed in this industry. Oh, yeah, no, of course. <laughs> yeah. And so our flagship product is a consumer app. It's basically a financial super app. We are trying to, or rather what we've achieved so far, is just bring a host of different services into a single application, but in a way that doesn't bombard the user. Almost like trying to build a mall within an app. So whether you are shopping, making payments, receiving remittances from another country, purchasing insurance, you know, sending a gift card, all of those in a single sort of like um, very well-crafted application so that as a user, I don't have to have five apps to do the five things that I want to do. Well, we're available in over 150 countries, but we have a strong presence in six African countries and about 27 European countries. Even though we have availability in other countries, I'm super passionate about building in Africa for Africans. And that's kind of like what the story about the reason for starting the platform is. Yeah. yeah. What was David before Honeycoin? Yeah. Why did you start the company? And, and our, our audience loves listening about the do's and don'ts. Yeah. So make it as informative, helpful as you can. For the most part, pretty traditional. Uh, so grew up in Nairobi. The only non-traditional aspect of my upbringing is I studied in an uh, American system school. O-levels, A-levels within the same system. Amazing. Um, went on then to, I did a computing degree at a university in Coventry, although I chose to do it fully remotely. The reason for that is I had been coding for like a long time. So I started coding at like around nine, uh, started my first, I like to call it, a, well, it was more of an app, but I started my first company at around 14, 15. Amazing, love and, it. <laughs> and what it was, it was actually an e-commerce platform. So I built, it was like a native application similar to what Jumia is right now. Okay. Um, but basically built it out of uh, Dar es Salaam and it was available in East Africa. Super encouraging to see because it then showed me early on that you can actually build something that is valuable to people and they will pay for it. They mm -hmm. will pay for a service. And that's coming off the back of just literally hacking away at projects, uh, earning zero or $150 here and there. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, I was doing it for fun. I, I like to think of um, the technical journey or rather the entrepreneurship journey I've been on as learning a skill that is very valuable, but initially I just wanted to do the skill by way of passion. Exactly. And then it's taking that skill and now seeing that people are willing to pay for it that then showed me, okay, you can actually do this. You can build solutions, you can build products and people, not just customers, but external uh, sort of like uh, stakeholders or investors would be willing to one, mm -hmm. put in capital or either uh, acquire the actual product. At that time, you see, there was no like flood wave or pay stack. No, there was no API. Not. So what we actually did is we had to build let me say, low-level infrastructure for customers to be able to deposit money in, yeah. whether it was mobile money, whether it was like a card acquiring. I remember us tying up very hacky solutions, but we had to because at the time, we were the ones who are crafting the payment experiences for our customers. And I think that early on is what also started to show me that, okay, whilst you're doing e -com, there's a huge gap within fintech. We then went on to start uh, basically a financial advisory company based out of the U.S., 
We then scaled that to about 800,000 users together with two other co-founders. Wonderful. And then um, I then exited my stake, but they went on to run it. And so it's still alive right now. It was called Financial Professional. R- right after that, actually, I then chose to join Flutterwave. Uh, so I consulted at Flutterwave as a integrations engineer, but it was more or less like um, our work was to work with external companies integrating with Flutterwave infrastructure yeah. to either help them build, you know, better payment experiences, or if they just don't even know how to integrate, integrate or have a technical team, it was kind of like just, you know, diving in and really helping to mesh the two things. So working at Flutterwave kind of showed me that this is a company that is very motivated to build payment experiences, but they're just missing a complete, let me say, segment of customers on the consumer angle. Okay. And then also from a business perspective that I feel we could be adequately serving. And of course, because this is not my train to, uh, to, 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 to this is not my ship to steer, yeah. I can say, oh, let's move towards this whole And I'm assuming direction. by then Flutterwave was quite large. Yeah. It wasn't in its... Early, early stages, stages. no so of course they've not they've set the direction yeah they've company. set the direction and then also even if you are a, a, an engineer who has some level of influence with other senior engineers it doesn't it, it won't serve the purpose of saying no we should probably be focusing on this and it makes sense right because yeah. david you from a young age built companies and yeah. you're in the driving seat mm-hmm. so when you came to Flutterwave, yeah. you are now supporting them yes And that drive of being able to make decisions that can have a huge impact on the company's business is something that you would... I don't see you ever going to corporate. No, 100%, yeah. It's like an addiction, (laughs) I don't think I'll survive. (laughs) Literally, you feel as if you're... Like, let's say, gradually just cutting away at your person, like your actual, let's say, being and drive, yeah. because it's a completely different environment. And it serves some people, but I think as entrepreneurs, it definitely will not serve us to a large extent, or rather for a long period of time. Yeah, but what ahead. I love about that is mm-hmm. that you knew you wanted to be in fintech. Yeah. So you went and you got experience mm-hmm. within an fintech upcoming company. Yes. And you learned the problems. Mm-hmm. And that's a really big do. I think if I was to just stop there and actually think one of the biggest, I guess, indicators or a, a really big um, tip I would give to other entrepreneurs who are starting on is definitely... If you want to build a company within an industry and you have zero experience there, go join a company first. Because if you think that you can be an expert within this particular domain that you've chosen, Mm -hmm. but you don't have the context of that actual industry, you'll fail. Exactly. You Mm -hmm. know your strengths, your weaknesses. Yes. And I think as a founder, that's very important. Oh, 100%. Because you can always hire for your weaknesses. Yes, yes. And you can build on your strengths. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. As I remember at the time, now just really more, well more or less freelancing and 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 hacking on projects with my friends mm-hmm. and we sort of like build collectively and they would just like you know pay me hourly or so on and so forth yeah. but it was just more collaborative and not necessarily anything serious and i used to use paypal to get paid um by them and it was march of 2020 where i remember uh getting paid and then i get an email from paypal we froze in your account. We can't tell you why, <laughs> okay. um, but essentially, yeah, we'll, you'll have to submit all of these supporting documents and so on and so forth. And I'm like, and can I add to that? Yeah. Till today, we were trying to get our because we have diasporas investing in Kenyan investments. Okay, yeah. And one of them asked, "Can I invest via PayPal?" Uh huh. It works, but yeah. we can't settle to a local bank. No, you cannot. And so then, so, <laughs> I don't need it. There's this like, yeah, there's this bridge. It's like fragmented it's as fragmented, well. Yeah. And and to me, that like account freeze and just thinking to myself, you know, why is this the standard? Like, why do I have to go rely on a, a Western company that has built an amazing company that is serving oh. the US, Europe, and for the most part, the Asian market really well? But from the context of me sitting here in Kenya, in Africa, there's no actual solution that is tailor-made for the pain points that I face. Yeah. And so I was thinking about that and then just deeply just saying, okay, why don't I build a way for creators or freelancers, engineers, or even career professionals who are working remotely um, to get paid? Amazing. So we actually wanted to build a way for gig workers, creators, freelancers to get paid no matter where they are mm-hmm. on the continent from a company that is outside of it. So US, Europe, UK. And the journey has actually just evolved, but I think at the core, we're still solving the same problem. Okay. We want to decrease the fragmentation problem on mm-hmm. the continent and outside of it, and more or less actually just build bridges between African countries 
and their counterparts. Mm -hmm. So whether you're doing business or trade or have loved ones on the continent, and then also build bridges between diaspora communities paying in. Well, it could be a, uh, you're paying, getting paid by a loved one. Yeah. It could be you're getting paid by a business. It could be any sort of payment experience. But at the core of it, we just want to build a very seamless way for that type of transaction to happen. And then over time, we started to think, OK, we've solved the payment bit very well. Mm -hmm. Now, how can we add value, add services onto yeah. the platform? And it, it's evolved by way of actually first solving that you know, infrastructural, very low level payment uh, headache that yeah. consumers and businesses alike face. And David, I think that's an excellent segue yeah. to us to talk about uh, the Honeycoin and Dovu partnership. Ooh, yeah. yeah, very excited. I can't <laughs> Super wait. exciting, yeah. <laughs> uh, just for those of you uh, tuning in, so essentially, as you all know, Dave, uh, Dovu offers, offers savings and investment opportunities to both local. Um, and global investments. So before Dovu, there was no company no. in Kenya that could allow you to invest as little as $50. Mm -hmm. And that's becoming even more useful because our currency has depreciated about 23%. Yeah. Ouch. <laughs> even when I say it. <laughs> no, I'm feeling um, it. And you were feeling it, right? Yeah, and so um, we've seen a lot of traction recently. Yeah. And, you know, we're helping our Kenyans, our Africans become more financially included globally. Yes. And I think because we're global citizens, mm -hmm. as you know, David, we both have smartphones that are, you're wearing Nike trainers. You know, we <laughs> like to spend in the global sense because we're yes. global citizens, mm -hmm. but yet we couldn't access uh, global, global markets. investments. Yeah, yeah, global markets, international markets as a local. As mm -hmm. a local. Mm -hmm. And again, you would have all those challenges. So if yes. you went to other providers that were providing these services in the States mm -hmm. and you try to open an account, they'd say, hold on, KYC doesn't check out. Yeah. Uh, I can't confirm your post box. Or you have to convert your shillings into dollars and then invest, so you're losing like 10, 20 percent. Exactly. Before even investing. And then if you think <laughs> about how busy the average African is, they're like, yeah. oh, forget it. Dover now makes it easy and accessible to invest in global markets. Yeah. And I cannot stress enough mm -hmm. that as a Kenyan or African, you should hold 50 percent of your wealth in USD. You should. Not just hold, yeah. but invest it, because mm -hmm. we all need to make our money grow. We do. And we need to hedge against any of the, let's say, unprecedented inflationary times that we're living in. You could be a Kenyan, you could be a Nigeria, and we all share the same experience. Exactly. Not to say that you shouldn't transact and actually try to infuse local economies with your actual currency, but you should, as an individual, be thinking about how you're hedging, how you're investing to protect yours and also your family's future. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So what we realized was um, there's a lot of synergies within the fintech space. Yeah. And David and I were catching up and he said, you know, now we're looking like he just said that to actually add more value-added services to our user base. Yes. So Dovu and Honeycoin have partnered together mm -hmm. uh, to allow the users of Honeycoin to yeah. make seamless investments both locally and globally. Globally, yes. One of the reasons that it was a no-brainer to partner with you is exactly what you're doing is what we are trying to do. You guys have pioneered a new category locally, yes. and I'm, I strongly believe that you'll be able to replicate that across the continent. 100%. And we definitely want to, we like to, and, and prioritize aligning ourselves with folks who are, yes, defining a category, but also have built something that is not only proprietary, but extremely seamless to use. And exactly. so the, let me say, the evaluation of thinking, okay, you know, yes, I'm excited to partner, but what does the infrastructure look like? What does the tech look like? Mm -hmm. And for us, any for, for all the steps that we've gone through, it, it just became more clearer because of how excellent you guys have built not Thank only you. a consumer platform, but also the infrastructure that allowed us to integrate. Exactly. And I think for me, it's in just from a distribution perspective, we want to bring our customers to have access to the Novu services that you guys already provide. Correct. So it's more or less that we are getting so much value just by adding this you know, new functionality, but more so we are bringing accessible global investments to now a much larger consumer base. You guys, of course, have a consumer platform. We have a consumer platform as well, and they're serving the same need. And so for us, it's more like, how can we build delightful experiences mm -hmm. that will truly have an impact yeah. to local consumers? And um, I mean, it's, 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 it's extremely exciting to me just to think about what we will be able to do once this launches. On the African continent, when you build a startup, you have to build the infrastructure with it. You do. 
Yeah. So every time you expand into another country, you have to go and think about how do I do payments? Yes. How do yes, I give yes, access yes. to people to help them grow their mm -hmm. wealth so they stay on my platform longer? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So these all these things as a founder you have to think about. And what yeah. I love about both of our, our products is that we actually are building infrastructure first. We are which I think in the long term leads to much more benefit to mm -hmm. the end user oh, yeah, 100%. than just selling one part of a product. You know, we are doing this together so that we can truly get to where we want to get to and maybe even faster than we, we would have if we just decided to do these things alone. Exactly. Yeah. And I and I love the, the founder openness between us to actually grow together. Yeah. Because yeah. naturally by integrating together, we're adding value to your platform. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. likewise, eventually there'll be a reverse way where we can help with settlements of oh, other types of, you know, our customers will say, oh yeah, use Honeycoin because it's easier to settle your money. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And, and so like, the, it's kind of like you have a wallet, then you have investments. So yeah. you have a broker, you have a wallet. It's like you have this single point point yep. of both investing and storing your value. Exactly. No, I couldn't agree more. And even in just thinking about it from... Uh, uh, entrepreneurship and founder perspective, I think a lot more founders need to be thinking about how we can collectively help to grow the ecosystem. Yeah. Even if you're running a company that's in agri-tech or that's in health tech or that's in fintech, we pride ourselves in not being uh, choosy yeah. or in being uh, very, you know, let's say segmented because I truly believe that as founders who are building on a continent that is seeing, yes, unprecedented growth, but also just very, very nuanced, different problems and challenges that we are facing on the ground. Yeah. So why should we then try to, let's say, say, oh, you're doing your own thing, I'm doing my own thing. We come together and say that, okay, what you're trying to achieve is very closely related to what I'm trying to achieve, or we at least share these same experiences. The rate of expansion and acceleration that we should be able to achieve if we do it together is just mutually beneficial. At the beginning, you said that your goal was to empower gig workers, creators, to be financially included globally. Yes, to be borderless in a way. Mm. Exactly. So how do you see this uh, partnership where now not only can they receive payments, but they can actually create financial wealth for themselves? Mm. How do you look at financial inclusion and what are your longer term plans as well around financial inclusion when it comes to Honeycoin? Especially because the demographic that we're serving has now, of course, is, is a lot broader than it was in the beginning. Yes. You know, we went from like a creator focus to now very much consumers and businesses. Yeah. So you can be anyone, whether you're a 25-year-old artist or you're a 40-year-old uh, mother of two that works in finance or corporate, mm -hmm. you can still use our platform. To me, financial inclusion just means simply that no one is left out. And to us, our ethos in saying that we're building inclusive products, that we are tailor-making our experiences to their evolving needs. Yes. So for now, that's... What we've seen and noticed is that, yes, people have problem or pain point around global payments or receiving payments um, from other countries into the country that you live in. Mm -hmm. They also have a problem in using five platforms for the one thing that they want to do. It could be insurance, airtime, bill payment, and so on and so forth. Exactly. We've solved for that. But now the problem that we're seeing and that we truly want to start to um, address is savings and investments. It's hedging. Mm -hmm. It's that we've noticed that, yes, we've solved this pain point of paying in, paying out, storing your value in a, in a wallet, but you still have a bank account. But now we are coming to a closer or more intimate pain point, which is that you feel as if the value of your money is depreciating over time. From an inclusion perspective, we want to build a user experience, but more so a platform that is now saying, hey, listen, let's help you slow the depreciation, mm -hmm. but even better, let's help you make more from your idle funds. And that involves then aligning ourselves with partners like Novo, also involves aligning ourselves with folks who are not only helping on the saving and investment uh, side of things, but also on the debt and credit side of things. Of course. An interesting stat that I actually heard is 90% of the most used apps in most African countries are actually loan apps because most consumers are in debt and it's a consistent cycle. It is. So the first way that we can address the problem is, hey, when you earn your money, park it here. So park it with Andovu. Yeah. The second way that we want to address this problem over the next three to five years is I want to understand why you as a consumer are borrowing funds. Exactly. Is it for a business? Is it for your family? So then I want to now be involved in that transactional flow to kind of like help 
decrease the burden or innovate around that. So one, yes, now you're saving and investing, but number two, from an inclusion perspective, you don't need to be consistently borrowing because we've actually solved that pain point. The first thing that someone thinks about when they're stuck with money is that I need to take a loan. Mm -hmm. And so you, we mm -hmm. get lots of queries on Dovu saying, hey, are you, can I get a loan? Yeah. And even our natural evolution of our product would be not to just offer loan, but do collateralized lending. Yes. Which simply means that if you're saving with Dovu and you have a savings and investment portfolio that's growing month on month or year on year, sorry, 20%. Yeah. If you've got 500,000 shillings saved with Dovu, but mm -hmm. now you're in an emergency or you want to increase your income by investing in a new business or you have a need of, you know, wanting to create a retirement home in Shags. Yeah. But, and you need a bit of money to borrow, mm -hmm. you actually can borrow against your savings and investment portfolio yes. while yes. it's still earning mm -hmm. and actually you at a better rate. So yes. that's the innovation, innovation we're trying to bring. That's amazing. And I, we haven't Sort of like collateralizing it, it on, in, on your investments. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that hasn't even happened in the West. No. So no, I know yet. from my um, knowledge, if I am a high net worth individual in the States or mm -hmm. in the UK, yeah. you can bring your stock portfolio and say, hey, I also have this stock portfolio. Yeah. But for the everyday Westerner, mm -hmm. that's not an option. No. They only look at like what's in your savings account, how much are you bringing home on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. So but this you, is your credit allocation. Yeah. This is the buffer we'll give you. Exactly. But yeah. they don't have, oh, let me add my investment and stocks portfolio mm -hmm. to give you a better lending rate or a loan. Yeah. No, that would be innovation in itself. It would and be massive. massive. Saying that I can keep my money earning interest with this investment uh, manager, fund manager, yeah. or, or, or investment platform and still borrow against it. It's, it's, it's like as if to say, I'm getting credit, but I'm still earning. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. And then one other thing you mentioned that was super interesting was around helping people figure out that lending isn't the first option. Yes. And there's a bit of education. There is. There's a massive education element because it's almost ingrained and it's a habitual It's a habitual nature now. It's yeah. like people have now been conditioned to think, yes, if I'm in a fix, I'm going to go for a loan and then I will pay back that loan. And if I'm in another fix, I'll get another loan again. Yeah. But it should actually come from the perspective of how can I set up structures right now to basically not require the loan later. Yeah. And it's, of course, then you have to think from a long-term perspective, and it is still a nuanced problem because you can't tell the person who needs capital right now, no, invest now so that you don't have to do this later. Yeah. But if you educate them to start putting in those measures, even with as little as you said, $50 over time, then now they're thinking, I've created this kind of like, um, let's sort of say, small investment pool mm -hmm. of my own that is helping me to then not deeply rely on just credits um, for my growth, my own personal growth or my own upkeep. And it's it's one of those things that I think over time also just helps to stabilize economies, but also lift, uh, steadily increase how many people are below the poverty line. When founders definitely on the African continent put together a company, yeah. actually the impact is... If we could quantify, it's huge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that's what we're really excited about. No, 100%. And it's, I think it's also from the perspective of when I think about Honeycoin and Dove and what we're, we're trying to build here, it's, we're not trying to build a cute solution. It's like we, we want to build category-defining products yes. that have a direct impact in the countries that we're in and on the continent that we're in. Yeah. And that involves then thinking... I'm not going to build a software as a service solution to help you send emails faster. No, yeah. I want to help. We have bigger problems. <laughs> we have much bigger problems. <laughs> and and our consumers, our customers have much bigger problems, both on a consumer level and a business uh, yeah. level as well. And that's why it involves having a long-term mindset, which I think all founders should have. Yes. If you have this cyclic two, three-year stint mindset, I don't think you can solve a big problem no. because it doesn't take that amount of time to solve it. You know, wise men plant trees that they will never uh, benefit from the shade. Correct. Uh, and and that, I think that saying really solidifies what the, the mission that I'm personally on. Mm -hmm. I, I want to build a product that will be as ubiquitous as a stop sign. Yeah. No one asks who designed who the stop it? sign. Yeah. But it's something that we use in every single country that we're in yeah. as a traffic indicator. Yeah. And if I'm able to build, if I'm on this journey to build something that will not only outlive me, but then have an impact to which that it becomes ubiquitous, then that is, I think, a, 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 
let me say, uh, a take on the mission accomplished uh, list. Yeah, what would be the one thing that makes you really um, excited mm -hmm. to hear from your customers two, three, four, five years down the line? I've thought about it briefly, but never, never in depth. But I think for us, customer success looks like we start hearing from our users that, let's say, I used to rely on credit to run my business. And I no longer do that because of these features that you guys have built. Okay. Or that it used, to it used to cost me up to 8% to receive money from my family in the diaspora. It now costs me 1%, 2%. That is, to me, not only a job well done, but, okay, we've got it right there. Yeah. Now let's keep building. If I was to go lower and think about the first principles of what that customer is actually saying, is because I'm using your platform, you're either saving me money or you're helping me make more for my money. For me, the success of our customers looks like we have lift, lifted them up from thinking about their basic needs mm -hmm. or thinking about the basic consistent problems that they are have been facing for a long period of time and they no longer think about them because of us. And David, do you know what's really interesting? Actually, I was doing some research and actually 60% of the African continent are there. They are thinking about basic needs. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there, we need more and more founders like ourselves mm -hmm. who are trying to elevate them oh, to 100%. now think about the things they can do once they have money. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. It starts with us. Mm -hmm. It does. It starts with us. And just like you said earlier, it's also an educational 100%. Um, uh, obligation. It's, it means that we also have to think, how are we educating our customers to actually see the value in using us? Mm -hmm. Because... Marketing can seem like, oh, I'll tell you, this is great and this is why you should use this. And then you sign up and you're like, oh, this is a no-brainer. Yeah. But it's not actually like that. Um, when you build a platform, it's so much more nuanced because you have to understand that every customer that will come to your platform is coming with a bias of their experience Correct. and the platforms that they've used. And it's also cultural. It is. Maybe I don't trust to give my money to a platform. Maybe I'm used to storing it under a mattress. Yes. And there is a subset of people much older who have been used to saving their money in that way. So now you're telling someone, no, take your money and this digital value or this percentage return that you're getting is actual real value. Real money. You have to educate them on that. And then more so to educate them on this is how to use the platform or we'll build a more bespoke experience for you so that you can use whatever app or, or, or platform that you are using in a more seamless manner. That is all an educational aspect and up to us as founders as well to think about that when we're marketing the products. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. David, I have loved this conversation. <laughs> it's touched upon yeah, same here. everything from mm -hmm. like founder do's and don'ts all the way to how we're seeing and creating an impact and yeah. what we're trying to achieve. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for coming and joining no, us. I have loved the conversation as well. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Um, to me, like, I think the, the next thing is just for us to launch and just like hit it out of the park. I agree. <laughs> I'm so excited. And just for everybody who is looking for a way to get paid or make seamless payments, buy airtime, etc., please download the Honeycoin app. It's available both on Android and on iOS. Mm -hmm. And then likewise, if you're whether you have Honeycoin or you come directly to Dovu, I don't care. The, the mission... The vision is the same. We yeah. want to empower Africans to create wealth mm -hmm. so we can stop thinking about basic necessities yeah. and actually saying, okay, what else can I do for my family, yes. my children, yes. create generational wealth? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, please check out Honeycoin. It's a very great, easy app to use. I actually have it on mine, uh, my phone. And, yeah, thank you so much, and we'll catch you on the next episode.